I want to thank you for inviting me here and for all the help you've given me starting up as a new director. Um, it's been a great pleasure to work with Eric, and I look forward to doing so in the future and with NHGRI in general. Um, Eric asked me to give an overview of what's happening at NIGMS and of especially of areas in which uh, NHGRI and NH NIGMS um, have particular uh, potential for collaboration and synergy. So let me just start by probably reminding you what the missions of NIGMS are. And there really are two overarching missions. The first is to promote fundamental research on living systems in order to lay the foundation for advances in disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And then our second overarching mission, which is related to the first, is to enable the development of the best trained, most innovative, and productive biomedical research workforce possible. And I'll just highlight this phrase here, lay the foundation. And this is one of the places that you'll see that NHGRI and NIGMS um, share uh, common goals. Because really, the mission of NIGMS is to lay the foundation through its research portfolio and through its training um, programs on which the other institutes, the institutes that are focused on specific diseases and organ systems, build their research and training portfolios. We have five program divisions. They are the Division of Cell Biology and Biophysics, led by Kathy Lewis, Pharmacology, Physiology, and Biological Chemistry, led by Mike Rogers, Biomedical Technology, Bioinformatics, and Computational Biology, which, as Eric said, is a place of significant um, synergies and, and uh, shared interests with NHGRI, which is led by our newest division director, Susan Gregorick, who came to NIGMS from the Department of Energy. Training Workforce Development and Diversity, which for many years was led by Cliff Poudry, who many of you may have interacted with. Um, he retired just uh, maybe six weeks, two months ago, um, and Allison Hall is the acting director while we conduct a search for that position, which I'll tell you more about in just a second. And finally, last but certainly not least, genetics and developmental biology, again, an area of shared interest, um, which is led by Judith Greenberg, who is also the acting deputy director of NIGMS. Now, those two points bring up uh, something uh, that I'd like to make you all aware of, which is we have two ongoing and very important searches at NIGMS. The first is for a permanent deputy director, um, and the second, as I said, is for um, a permanent director of the Division of Training, Workforce Development, and, and Diversity. And to put this last point in perspective, 50% um, almost of the pre-doctoral T32 training grant slots that NIH gives are from NIGMS. So um, in many ways, as Eric alluded to, we are the 800-pound training gorilla of NIH. And so this really is one of the most important positions in training uh, workforce development and diversity in the country. And so I'd really be very grateful if um, you could make your colleagues and others aware of these two positions at NIGMS. And one place to find information about them is through our blog, the NIGMS Feedback Loop, which can be found here or just by searching Feedback Loop and NIGMS. Now, they say you don't know an institute until you know its budget. So as Eric said, our budget this year is about $2.36 billion. And this simplified pie chart gives you some understanding of how the Institute uses uh, this uh, investment of taxpayer money. Almost 90 percent, 89 percent of the budget goes to fund extramural research, so research done at, at universities and other institutes across the country. About 8 percent is invested in training, workforce development, and diversity programs, although there is some overlap between these two areas, I should say. Um, about 3 percent goes to run the institute, and then much less than 1 percent is our intramural research program, which is actually really just one postdoctoral program called the Postdoctoral uh, Research Associate Training Program for the Pratt Program, which funds postdoctoral fellows to work uh, throughout the NIH at all the institutes and centers, as well as at the FDA. Well, what you can see here is that we are almost a completely outward-facing institute. We basically you know, for all intents and purposes, really don't have an intramural research program. Everything is going to fund research in the extramural community. A couple of hot issues that are um, being discussed and thought about and worked on very closely right now at NIGMS, which may be of interest to you. The first is 
um, that we are working very hard to renew and reinvigorate our commitment to investigator-initiated, question-driven research. And so by investigator-initiated, I mean that the ideas are generated by the investigators in the extramural community. How they're going to approach these problems and organize the research is also um, decided and established by those investigators in the community. So it's as opposed to what you might call top-down or maybe programmatic research where um, groups um, in cons consultation with the NIH decide that certain areas um, need targeted funding and we therefore would put funds directly into those research areas or into that particular arrangement of scientific research. Now I should say that the difference, the dichotomy I'm drawing here is not between investigator initiated and team science because team science can be and frequently is investigator initiated. So when we're talking about investigator initiated research, we're talking both about traditional single PI based research and now increasingly important team based research. So I think we're very cognizant of the fact that as um, information becomes more complex, as there is more and more need for interdisciplinary approaches to problems, team based science um, is increasingly important. And so as we reinvigorate our commitment to investigator initiated research, we're also looking carefully at how we can best support team based um, investigator initiated research. Now, the history of NIGMS, as some of you may know, is in investigator-initiated research. So you may ask, why do we need to spend any time and effort reinvigorating our commitment to it? And this graph really tells the story. So what you see here um, in the blue bars and on the left-hand y-axis is the funds NIGMS had invested in targeted research. So this is research focused on a specific uh, area of science or a specific way of arranging uh, researchers over time from 1990 to 2013. And you can see that in the early 1990s, NIGMS had very little of its funds invested in targeted research. Between 1998 and 2003, which as I'm sure you know corresponds to the NIH budget doubling, this really increased dramatically. And interestingly, it continued to increase for several years after that. Now, it made a lot of sense when there was continually additional money every year coming into the system to invest some of that uh, in targeted research, for instance, to try to ignite new areas of science, to try experiments in new ways of arranging scientists uh, to perform science. Um, the red line, which is the right-hand y-axis, is the reciprocal of this. So this is the percent of the NIGMS portfolio that was invested in investigator-initiated research. And again, you can see that in the early 1990s, 99 percent of our portfolio was investigator-initiated. And then during the budget doubling, again, it fell uh, to the point that now only 80 percent of our portfolio is investigator-initiated. So it certainly will come as no surprise to you uh, that the budget doubling has been over for a decade. And so given this, we feel it's very important to re-equilibrate the system to this post-budget doubling um, reality. And so we are working to move this red line up in this direction, which is going to mean moving these blue bars down in this direction. And so that's something that we've started both short and long-term efforts to uh, rebalance our portfolio, uh, again, to re-equilibrate uh, what NIGMS focuses on um, in this post-budget doubling um, world. Now another area um, that we're focusing on is thinking about whether we can find more efficient and more um, effective mechanisms to fund this investigator-initiated research. So we're looking to explore and do experiments with uh, new funding mechanisms that would be more stable, flexible, and efficient both for the investigators themselves and for uh, NIGMS. And so one project that we're very hard at work on and are hoping to roll out actually again as an experiment in the next year is a, a new mechanism that would support a PI's overall research program instead of forcing them to break their program up into individual projects and try to get funding for each of those separate projects um, differently. And so that's something I'm hoping in the next year we'll be able to begin as an experiment. Now, as Eric mentioned, we had a really first, on February 21st, 2014, we had a, a bilateral 
and I NHGRI and IGMS retreat, which I don't know was maybe was the first bilateral institute retreat in history that we know of, um, and it focused on four areas that we thought there would be particular uh, interest in overlap and synergy. The first is how the two institutes support research on the elucidation of biological function. The second was uh, how we support databases, which are uh, obviously very critical resources for the research community. In fact, they're only growing in importance as more and more information becomes available. How we support biomedical informatics and computational biology, and you saw that we have a whole division of that, and I'm sure you're aware that NI, uh, NHGRI is very heavily invested in those areas as well. And finally, mutual interest in how we best support technology development uh, for the missions of our two institutes. And we came up with a lot of interesting ideas in all of these areas, but the one that really stood out as needing immediate action and as a place where the two institutes could work together um, to try to really improve the situation, um, both for researchers and for the efficient use of uh, NIH funds, was in databases. As I said, databases are uh, critical resources for the scientific community. They're only going to be growing in importance given the the increasing amount of information that's available and the increasing complexity of that information. Um, but as I'll show you on the next slide, this growth of the importance of databases has translated into a growth, a growth of databases themselves and into a growth of the cost of the databases. And that really threatens to capsize the ship if we don't find more efficient and sustainable models to support these databases. They could really end up eating up very significant chunks of both of our budgets, as well as the budgets of other institutes. And that's shown here. This is actually a slide um, that I got, Phil Bourne made me aware of it from a website. A PhD student in the UK did a very nice review of the literature and uh, plotted the number of databases over time from the late 1990s to the present. And you can see this is roughly exponential. Um, so regardless of the exact mathematical form this is following, uh, it is, I think, fair to say that the number of biological databases that exist is increasing dramatically. And as I said, this just by mass action increases the potential cost of supporting these databases. And anecdotally, um, I think that what seems to be true is that the cost of the databases themselves is increasing as well. Um, and so as I said, this really threatens to eat up a very significant portion of our budgets and potentially capsize uh, the ship, as, uh, if you will. So this led Eric and I um, to think that we really needed to start thinking about this in a, in a very careful, data-driven, rational way. And so he and I put together a working group. And of course, the first thing we did in this working group was to build, uh, bring Phil Bourne, who, as Eric mentioned, is the new Associate Director for Data Science, on to really help lead this initiative, because this is exactly the kind of thing um, we are hoping that Phil uh, will take the lead on and will help us find appropriate models. And so this group has started working and started collecting data, analyzing the portfolios of the two institutes, and looking broadly at other institutes as well, to think about um, whether we can develop uh, proposals for more efficient um, and sustainable funding mechanisms to support the various databases that, that both our institutes and other institutes um, have right now, and which again are critical resources for the community and have to um, continue. Now another area that probably many of you are familiar with and have seen in the news is the general area of reproducibility, reproducibility of scientific findings. Um, you've probably seen it as uh, the frontline article of a whole issue of The Economist in the New York Times and the LA Times, etc. cetera. Um, Francis Collins and Larry Tabak had a very cogent commentary in nature outlining the problem and talking about some of the potential solutions uh, that the NIH was thinking of um, to address the issues. One of their key points, which I think you know, really resonated with me on a number of fronts, was that efforts by NIH alone will not be sufficient to affect real change in this unhealthy environment. That is, as with many of the other um, difficult problems that, that we're wrestling with right now, the NIH by itself can't fix them. It's an important part of the equation, but unless there are changes in universities, in the research community, um, and in other uh, stakeholders um, in, in the research process, 
very little will be accomplished. So we have to work together as an ecosystem, if you will, to try to affect changes to these um, challenging problems. So one point um, I'd like to make regarding this general reproducibility problem is that I think it's really at least two main problems which have been conflated in many of the discussions um, in the, the popular press. Um, and those two problems are, first, the reproducibility of the data themselves. So if another research group tries to perform the same experiment, will they get the same actual data, the same numbers, the same images, what have you? So that's one problem. The other problem is the strength of the conclusions drawn from the data. And those are related to one another, but they aren't the same thing. So in other words, um, were the conclusions that a research group drew from the data sound and, and fairly reasoned? Were they inflated? Were aspects of the data maybe left out in making the conclusions to make them uh, seem uh, more important? So again, those are related problems, but they aren't exactly the same. And I think they have been conflated in a lot of this discussion. Now, both of these problems, um, even if you take them apart, really are um, driven by three different, uh, albeit again related issues. The first is the sociology of science. For instance, the scientific reward system, how scientists are evaluated and promoted, for instance. The second are methodological problems uh, that can contribute to the uh, reproducibility of the data themselves or potentially the strength of the conclusions made from those data. And finally, contributing to both of these things are how we train and educate researchers. Um, how we do that is going to impact how well they are able to deal with these issues um, to impact these problems up here. So as I said, the training and education part is something that affects uh, the other parts very strongly. And so NIGMS, given its um, historical place in the training mission of NIH, we thought that this was an area in which we could have a particular impact. And so one thing we're doing, and we're actually on Friday going to be asking Council for concept clearance of this, is to put out a small FOA for the development of what we're calling exportable training modules. And so these would be modules in different formats that address different parts of this, uh, these issues here that contribute to the problems. So they could be online modules, they could be interactive videos, they could be case studies with some interactive component. They'd be developed by um, universities, faculty, other not-for-profit institutions across the country. Then they'd be made freely available so that anyone involved in training scientists at any level could use them um, in part of, as part of their training program. And so we're thinking we'll, we'll initially probably fund about six of these, assuming we get council clearance uh, to do this. Um, and then evaluate the program and see how it's working. Now, the second area, which is another place that Eric um, and I have come together uh, to work in, as a team, is in this methodological problem, uh, actual methodological, technological issues that may be contributing to the reproducibility of data and the strength of the conclusions drawn from those data. And the particular area we've been working on is reproducibility in cell culture studies. So tissue culture studies um, used as models of uh, biological phenomenon. And two of my program directors, Jim Dethridge and Zong Zen Ni, with help from a program analyst, Peggy Schnorr, have been doing a very deep dive into the literature for the past few months um, in this area to really see how bad the problem is. And you've certainly read about it in reviews, but we wanted to really dig into it for ourselves and find out just what was going on out there. And so here are some things that uh, Jim and Ni nee and Peggy have, have come up with from the, this deep dive into the literature. The first is that there are over 400 cell lines which have now been reported to be misidentified, and these date back to the 1960s. So these are cell lines that were said to be one tissue type, one tumor type, for example, and were later shown to be something else altogether. So at least 400 different cell lines um, have been misidentified. And through their analysis, what one finds is that in some cases when the misidentification is made public, the publications mis using that cell line as the misidentified type drop off dramatically. But in other cases, they persist. So even after a cell line is identified as not what it was said to be, you do in many cases see a persistence of use of that cell line uh, as its misidentified type. 
sort of uh, in keeping with that, in 2004, a survey was conducted that said that 70% of researchers had never actually checked the identity of the cell lines they were using. Uh, it's a bit of a staggering statistic. And Jim and Nee's analysis, um, based on more recent literature, would suggest that the situation hasn't actually gotten all that much better in the past decade. And consistent with that, uh, surveys of major cell repositories have set, shown that 14 to 30 percent of the cell lines submitted to them by outside researchers for cataloging and banking are actually misidentified. So that is pretty, I think, um, stark uh, information that up to a third of the cell lines that researchers thought were confident enough about to submit to a repository for storage and cataloging turn out not to be what the researchers thought they were. And this is an underestimate because the cell repositories can only say that something was not what it was said to be if it was something else that was known, right? If it was misidentified but was a cell line that hadn't been reported or wasn't easy to trace, they wouldn't know about it. So these numbers are actually underestimates. The 2013 survey of the literature said that less than half of cell lines reported in, in publications actually have an unambiguous identifier and source. So in other words, less than half of the papers out there actually say exactly what this cell line is and where it came from. So that's another somewhat alarming piece of data. All of this is despite the fact that there are actually fairly cost-effective and uh, inexpensive, fairly cost-effective and, and easy to use methods for identifying at least the most common cell types. Um, but they don't seem to be uh, actually in frequent use, unfortunately. Now, I've been focusing in the reproducibility and cell culture studies on this problem of cell line contamination and misidentification, but there are actually other issues um, that go below this. It's sort of like the skin of an onion. The misidentification is the top layer of skin. But then below this are issues, for instance, genomic instability, uh, genetic drift. So um, even if I say my cell line is, based on you know, tandem repeat analysis, what I think it is, is my version of that cell line the same as your version of that cell line? And if it's not, how genetically different is, is it? And how much does that affect the phenotype that I'm looking at or the biochemical pathways that I'm looking at? Infections, mycoplasma of viruses, fungi, turn out to be um, somewhat persistent and insidious. And actually, Jim and Nee have done a look into that. And a very large fraction of cell lines turn out to be infected with mycoplasma or the viruses, uh, frequently not known to the investigators. Finally, even once one does have all this under control, the particular growth conditions you use, the serum, the substrate, the oxygen and CO2 concentrations, can have significant effects on the phenotype and the outcomes of experiments. Um, we have been talking to lots of different people in, in uh, the research community, both intramurally and extramurally, and what you hear frequently about things like serum is, well, we found a serum that worked, so that's the first part that should alarm you, work should be in quotation marks here, and then we bought as much of that batch of serum as we could and did all of our experiments with that, right? So if you only see the phenotype or whatever it is you're looking at with one batch of serum, that should first of all raise alarm bells regarding reproducibility. Because, of course, five years down the road, that serum batch won't be available. And anyways, it sounds like you bought it all anyway, so no one else can use it. Um, so how robust are the conclusions that you're going to draw from that? So possible action areas that we're thinking about. And I should say that Eric and I have a working group. Francis Collins asked us to pull together a working group um, of not just our ICs, but other ICs as well. And we're getting external um, consultation for this group. Um, to think about these issues and to come up with some recommendations. And so two possible action areas uh, in general terms are to facilitate the development and dissemination of consensus standards for authentication, handling, controls, and reporting in cell culture studies. Um, and I should say that we're very cognizant of the need not to add additional unnecessary administrative burden onto researchers. That's an area that we're already concerned about. And so anything we do we're going to make sure is really high impact for the burden and low cost and as efficient to use as possible. And in that regard, we're also considering 
um, some kind of an effort, which may even make sense to put some targeted funding into, to promote development of more efficient and cost-effective tools for characterizing cell lines and the reagents in which they're grown. Um, and so you can think that if we could put in you know, relatively modest investment to get better, more cost-effective, more efficient tools to really ensure cell lines are what they are, to look at the genetic drift problem, to ensure the integrity of their agents and the consistency of their agents, that could have a very significant effect um, on the, the reproducibility problem uh, and the ability of basic research to be translated eventually into clinical advances. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about. I'd be very happy to hear uh, your thoughts from the NHGRI perspective and from your council's perspective. Well, thanks, John. So we, he's here to discuss, so this is a great So I was interested to hear about this notion of supporting the uh, a PI's full program rather than individual projects, which is more like the HHMI model right, or something right. like that. But um, I'm wondering how you're thinking about targeting it, because especially in the computational biology, bioinformatics piece of your program, a lot of those investigators will have, quote unquote, projects that are not only, you know, NIGMS supported, but may have funding from other institutes and so on and so forth. Are you thinking about bringing all of those projects in? Is this just for someone with multiple NIGMS funded projects? So what, what the initial thoughts? experiment would be just about NIGMS funded projects. Um, so if you had one of the program grants, that would fund your NIGMS portfolio. Um, if that took off, then I think maybe you know, we would catalyze a, a broader NIHY discussion, but that would be very far down the road, I would think. Um, from our perspective, if someone has, you know, a large basic research portfolio that we fund, if they then want to, you know, translate that into something that has more clinical apl applicability in one of the um, disease-focused institutes, that would make a lot of sense, and then that could go out uh, for funding by that institute. But initially, it would be uh, focused on NIGMS research yeah. funding. Of, of course, a, a few of the disease institutes also fund fairly basic computational Many of them, research. Many right. So it's... That's right. Yeah, um, that's why I asked. Yeah. Eric. First, thank you for taking the time to join thank us. Thank you. you know, we all agree about the increase in the number of these databases, but we also agree of the growing importance of these databases. C can you and Eric maybe talk for a minute about how you plan on monitoring, I guess, the long-term expense, which I know is on your mind, but recognizing the growing importance of the data and the need to make them more broadly distributed and how we're going to get other stakeholders, frankly, to contribute to the pot, which I think is probably what is necessary. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, I should say, we're at the early days of this. Um, Phil Bourne um, ha is starting to develop some ideas, you know, around efficiencies that one could create um, in the system by, for instance, having um, stronger connections between databases. Um, you've outlined the problem exactly, you know, very coherently that as they become more important, we can't pull back from them. In fact, we have to make sure that they are strengthened and, and continue to grow. But there's no way that we can pay for all of it, right? And so we do have to find ways to get other stakeholders to pay um, to support them. But I think we also really have to focus as well on creating efficiencies. Um, that if we just let unbridled growth take place without really thinking forward, what's the most efficient way to arrange this database world um, will end up, again, capsizing. So we need to think about both these things. Do you have thoughts, Eric? Well, I mean, first thing I'd say is uh, John has a slight disadvantage in that uh, he wasn't available for this meeting at, that, that the Moore Foundation held. Uh, he had somebody from GMS was there. Um, and, and, but he's also he's spot on saying these are just early days. I think we've, we've figured, out, we figured out the nature of the problem, at least at a first pass and recognize that it's only going to get worse. Um, it's not sustainable. And that we need to break down some of the 
cultural momentum we have of how we do business, sort of like the, the propagation of more databases just keep going. So there's a whole set of things. If this one issue, probably as, as much as any, is, is, is a, just completely validates the decision of Francis Collins and of NIH to create a new leadership position, have somebody, because you know, John and I are both passionate about this, but if it wasn't, I, if it, the solution's gonna have to come at a trans NIH level, so I think Phil Bourne is gonna have to lead us. And actually, what I got convinced at the Moore Foundation meeting was NIH can't solve this alone. I mean, this is in many ways a government problem, an international problem, a community. I mean, it just, just keeps layering in public, private, private. There's all sorts of things that are gonna have to get in the mix. So I think if, you know, sort of like, I suspect at the end of the day, if we try to fix this with a series of Band-Aids, we will not be successful. I think we got to take it down to the, you know, sort of the foundation and rebuild the whole way we do this. I, I agree, but I would caution against making everything with a sample size greater than five yeah. a BD, BD2K problem. Uh, oh, I, I, I want to be very clear. Problem. Well, uh, to be clear, <laughs> actually, to be clear, it's, this is not a BD2K problem. So that, again, I regard this as a NIH data science problem. BD2K might be a programmatic arm because some of what has to be done is not going to be to put on a program. Some of what's going to have to be done is to go out and solve uh, a, a community and a government and, an, and, a, and a nation, pro a national problem. And, and for that, you need a point person and a leader and a, you know, a person who makes this their full time and have the gravitas to pull this off. So. I, I, have become, I have become convinced in the last six months that this is one of the huge problems we face. And every curve that John, every graph that John looks at or I look at, and even if we look at it at a micro level, I mean, just the, just the data resources we support at NHGRI, if we're not, they would eat us inside out. I mean, we would have no program left if we, weren't, if we didn't figure out a solution to this. Um, so why don't we go to Dee and then Tony and then David. Uh, you mentioned in the retreat that one of the key areas you discussed was technology. Could you elaborate more on what you, what came out of that discussion? So th that was a preliminary discussion, and I think the main take-home point was that we're going to have another retreat and probably a series of retreats, and that's going to be the focus of one of them. Um, from our point of view, we have a, a branch of one of the divisions which is focused on technology development, and a question that we're asking is what is the most efficient and effective way to distribute the pot of money we have to really push forward technology development in a broad arena of different kinds of um, research topics, you know, from imaging to bioinformatics, et cetera. Um, and, and, and obviously there's a great deal of, you know, experience here, particularly in the genome sequencing realm, um, and we're hoping to tap into that. But Right now, our portfolio is distributed with P41 centers, as most of it, and then a very small R21 program, and not a lot in the middle. And so, you know, one thing we are thinking about is, again, what is the most efficient and effective way to support the broad range of technology development that needs to be done um, at all scales? Uh, so, Tony. Um, thank you for highlighting all the issues related to cell lines. Uh, I think many of us have used those over our careers, would agree with many of those problems. But in the pharmaceutical and biotechnology um, space, there's many more cellular assays which are being used to develop therapeutics. So how are you working with industry um, because they'll be using cell lines increasingly? And what standards do you hope to get there? Because that's very important for them. Right. To look at. And in many ways, that was the driver of you know, much of the reproducibility discussion was that um, results that were coming out of the preclinical research arena were not turning out to be translatable, either because they couldn't be reproduced or because there was some other issue. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about is having consultation from industry. Um, certainly on our council we have industry representatives who will be giving us advice. We're hoping to reach out as part of the working group that, that we formed to bring industry expertise and, and input into it. And there are also a number of stakeholder organizations, the Global Biological Standards Institute, for instance, that was recently formed, that are thinking about this problem as a totality, you know, from the industrial side, from the clinical side, to the basic science side. And we're going to be engaging them as well in this process. So, um, so John, thank you for coming to talk with us, and thank you for taking the job. Oh, thank yeah. you. Um, so, um, and I was I was pleased you talked you you spoke about the 
the the 15 year trend with regard to investigator initiated research versus um, targeted support for specific areas of research. And I was delighted and surprised actually to hear you say that you had intentions of rolling rolling that 15 year trend back at least. And so, um, and you you pointed out in the, the chart that at present it's about 80% investigator initiated in NIGMS's portfolio. So I have three three questions. And so one is, uh, if 80% is too low, mm -hmm. what's the right number? What's the target? Um, and then um, other questions are, what about other ICs in addition to NIGMS? Because that trend over the last 15 mm -hmm. years is not by any means limited to NIGMS. Mm -hmm. Um, and third is in so doing or in, in working to reverse this, what resistance, if any, would you anticipate from scientific or political spheres? Mm -hmm. right. All good questions. So the first one, we are actually in the middle of a strategic planning process, which, you know, basically I hit the ground running with our next five year strategic planning process. Um, and one of the key questions we're asking is what is the right number? It, it's definitely greater than 80 percent, I think, in, in our view. Is it 90? Is it 95? Um, probably, you know, we're not going to get back to 99 percent, um, given actually the need in places like technology development, which I think is an area that some targeted investment makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know the right answer. I just know that it needs to go up substantially. Um, the second question. What about, with, what about other ICs? Right, other ICs. So, there are 27 institutes and centers, as you know. Each one has a different mission. Um, and there's a reason you know, that there are so many. And how one focuses its, its investment and the way it arranges it is going to be different depending on what it's trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to, you know, focusing on fundamental research and discovery. And I think our view is that for us, and we can't do everything, that's part of, part of the issue to, to recognize. We cannot do everything that needs to be done in science. And so what we're really focusing on is promoting fundamental research by targeting you know, question-driven investigator initiated um, research and discovery. Well, I, I other could, other I, institutes, yeah. so I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging, but other <laughs> institutes um, have different missions and need to do things in different ways. Um, and so, you know, it, it, follow-up question would be: Is there a discussion, NIH wide, of that of uh, of a target uh, for a, a target for every institute that would be the same? I mean, minimum yeah, threshold. What I mean is, the 15-year trend right. is by no means limited to GMS, sure. and so therefore, the solution cannot be if there is if that's a prop if if where we are today is a problem. And I would be one who, mm -hmm. who says it is a very big problem. I don't know if others would agree, but if there are others who, who I mean, obviously you're, you're deciding uh, to vote <laughs> that that is a problem, at least at GMS, then the question is, is there in fact an NIH-wide discussion of this 15-year trend and its consequences? Uh, there have been discussions of many things related to uh, the consequences of you know, the budget doubling. One thing I've noticed since I've been here is that that may in many ways be the biggest challenges we face is that to re-equilibrate the system from the position it equilibrated into during the budget doubling has affected many different spheres, not just inside the NIH, but in the research community as well. So I go back to that, that the biomedical research community, the universities, other stakeholders also need to re-equilibrate in reciprocal ways. You know, in terms of specific institutes. Again, every institute has a different mission and needs to approach in a different way. So I think coming up with a single number would be problematic. And, you know, I usually go to Tony Fauci, for instance, can say absolutely, you know, without fear of contradiction that if we had a universal flu vaccine, it would be an incredibly important thing for humanity. And so putting targeted investment in that makes a lot of sense. For fundamental research, it's a very different equation. I can't say you know, if we had more money in transcription, it would be a great thing for humanity. Of course, people should be studying transcription, but it's not the same thing. And I think that needs to be recognized in this discussion, that different institutes really do have different missions. 
partially to answer the question, I, mean, I don't think there's been very much broad discussion around the institute director table about this issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, but I mean, a lot of other issues that might touch on. In fact, I'm not even sure, John, I've ever seen a, a graph or a table that shows that figure for all 27 institutes. I just know anecdotally right. about six or seven, but I don't know it. I don't. I haven't seen it for every institute. Yeah. And then your last question is about resistance, I and mean, I think any time you change, make change, um, there will be resistance. And you know, it, it's a question of making sure that we're heading in the right direction and uh, enough of the stakeholders agree with you. And I think at this point, from everything I have heard, all the feedback I've gotten has been very positive about this direction for NIGMS. Maybe, maybe a related question there would be if you look at the programs that have received targeted support, um, what is, what is in, in general, what is the half-life of those programs? Because that could have a lot to do with, um, yeah, how entrenched are those yeah, uh, targeted that, I mean, programs? That's a great question. That's something that we've looked at a lot and is really, we have decided that moving forward, we've laid out some guidelines for what would be um, appropriate for targeted funding of a scientific area. And one of the tenets of that for us is that they all have to have hard sunset clauses and that really five years, you know, is what we're going to target, uh, except in some exceptional circumstance, and then it would be 10. But many of these things have gone on for 15 years, which I would say, you know, that's, that in and of itself is a reason to roll the money back into the system. It's just if something hasn't become self-sustaining in 15 years, that is a fundamental research area. Um, you know, then it's time to rethink it. Okay, Lucilla and then Artie. Yeah, so th thanks for addressing the reproducibility issue. I think uh, as much as in cell lines, in informatics and in code, open source code, there's a lot of contamination and we can many times not reuse the, the code that someone else published. So, so I think that's, you know, because it's earlier in the game, it might be more addressable now than, than later on. Uh, the other aspect is about the ecosystem. While I do think parallel efforts need to go uh, internationally and with other agencies and so on, I would not underestimate the um, ability of NIH to change behavior in academic institutions. And I think one of the examples was when you did the multiple PI mm -hmm. uh, approach, because I, I saw that change in the way people do collaborations. So I think there there are many things that that might seem rather small, but it, but it change behavior. Yeah. I agree, and that's that's actually part of the reason that we're launching the training programs, the training modules FOA that we're hoping to get cleared, is that I think just by making people aware of the interest from NIH in this area, you can begin to shift the cultures. Um, so it's a point well taken. So I just wanted to follow up on that um, reproduce, reproducibility um, question in the context uh, of data in particular, but less uh, focusing on the costs of maintaining databases and more on incentives for getting PIs to put the underlying data from all of their work into <laughs> the public domain. And so as we all know, NIH has had this data sharing policy for now 10 plus years uh, for where every PI is with funding over half a million is supposed to have a data sharing plan. Um, now, how compliance has worked with that is unclear. And so I'm wondering what people's thoughts are going forward in terms of either using incentives uh, on the positive side or on the negative side with respect to uh, compliance with data sharing obligations. Yeah, so it's a great question. It's really an NIH-wide question. Yes, indeed. So one that I can't answer specifically, but um, Phil Bourne has worked, this is one of his highest priorities, I know, and so I would say um, he is developing all kinds of experiments and models um, to address these issues. So has, has he spoken to your council since he's been he here? He has not, but I'm, I'm trying to give the eye to Laura Rodriguez to go to a microphone and just give you a brief update on what's going on with the genome data sharing policy. Make sure the mic's on. Now it's on. Um, so I think to Artie's specific question about incentives um, to comply with the existing data sharing policies that we have, 
there are just lots of discussions going on about what we might be able to do um, and where the limits of that are and how can we produce carrots that are sufficiently enticing where those limits are to maybe get people even a little bit further. But beyond that, for as to Eric's point about genomic data sharing and the expansion of the genomic data types coming in, um, we do have a policy that has um, been approved internally, at least through the first step of that internal approval, and so we are hoping that that will be out in the next four to six weeks, pending um, the various stages that needs to go through, and so then we'll be able to talk about it. Implementation still won't be planned until um, 2015, for, and that would be for applications for funding that are coming in in 2015, so not for funding until 2016, but it's in place. Other questions for John? So to be, oh, oh Howard. Uh, thank you, and, and it's, um, it's been quite remarkable to see all the, uh, the information that's been attributed to you since you've taken the, uh, the leadership role, um, often by, by people who can't even spell your name correctly. Um, the, well, it's a challenging the, name, I the, Well, I didn't mean that part. I, I meant the first name. Um, uh, the, uh, no, I'm just joking. Um, w one of the things that it's always a challenge for your institute is where's the line between too, too clinical and clinical enough but still fundamental? And you know you you literally have to face it with things like the PGRN, and then there are other elements that are you know heading that direction, or you have to pull back. How, how do you how are you going to approach that in, in general? What's your mindset? Well, we do have a number of clim clinical areas, as you know, that we're responsible for. So trauma, for instance, yeah. uh, wound healing, burn, sepsis, um, anesthesia. And we also now are the home of the Office of Emergency Care Research. So we do have some very clinically um, relevant areas. Our general philosophy is that within those areas, we are looking for um, clinical advances, but also tying them to fundamental research that will give you know a, a fundamental understanding of the underlying processes that lead to these clinical advances. So that's how we try to tie in those clinical areas our fundamental research mission to um, pr promoting um, clinical medicine in those areas. Um, it, it's a good question. Um, yeah, it is. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. it. Well, thank you, John. That was just spot on, and I knew it would be. And I'm sure this council will continue to hear in the coming months and years uh, things going on with NHRI and NIGMS working together and trying to solve some of the problems that affect both our individual institutes. But trust me, part of the reason, like John and I, got stuck with. Uh, I shouldn't say stuff. We got uh, asked by uh, Francis to co-chair this working group about cell lines is because uh, two of us are, shall we say, rather vocal around the institute director table. So for some of these corporate things, I'm just uh, quite sure the two of us are going to end up doing a lot of things together trying to help deal with NIH issues in addition to our individual institute issues. So we are spot on time. Rudy, you to tell us?